in many fish and wildlife studies, we measure many response variables because we know species respond to a variety of different factors. In these situations, multivariate analyses can be extremely helpful in trying to understand how species are responding to environmental gradients. But there can also be a lot of pitfalls associated with these techniques. So I want to briefly review some of the approaches that are used in our field and talk about some of the assumptions and considerations when using multivariate analyses. So as I mentioned, multivariate analyses uh, refer to that class of statistical analyses where several response variables are measured simultaneously on each experimental unit. And in our fields, this will often be things like vegetation parameters, cover, height, species diversity, and so on. Uh, in aquatic environments, it might be the length and depth of pools, water temperature, um, other kinds of water quality measures, and so on. And we often feel like there's a number of different factors that could be influencing species. So we uh, measure as many of those that we think are important as possible. And then there's a variety of different ways when you collect all this information that it can be analyzed. One of the simplest multivariate analyses is known as the Hotelling's T-squared test, where you measure a number of different uh, response variables on, in this case, two groups, and ask if there's a difference when you consider all of those variables together versus looking at them one at a time. So an example uh, where this might be used and a study I was a part of is we treated um, grassland areas with pesticide to reduce grasshopper numbers and then measured the weight, tarsus length, and other things of birds and treated an untreated area. Uh, and what you might find is that when you look at any one of those variables alone, you don't see a difference. But when you consider them together, you may see a difference. And this is seen in this figure in the upper right-hand corner of this slide. If you look at the blue and the green ellipses, um, you can see how I've underlined the variation in the green ellipse along the x-axis and the y-axis. Um, and you can see that there may not be that much difference in that x variable. If you look at the blue and green ellipses, there's a lot of overlap. Same thing if you look at look at it along the y-axis, a lot of overlap. But when you look at both of them together, because there's uh, this correlation between the two uh, variables, in a sense, um, you see that when you look at the overlap along that diagonal, it's less than the overlap along any each of the axes alone. And this is basically what we're looking at or looking for. Now, there are some stringent assumptions that come along with this shown in this uh, figure in the lower right corner. And that is that you're assuming that we have what we call multivariate normality, so that the variables are normally distributed um, uh, across both all of the variables that you're measuring. And we're also making assumptions about equal variances in the groups um, among those variables. The extension of the Hotelling's T-squared test to multiple groups is uh, known as a MANOVA, or multivariate analysis of variance. And again, here you're just collecting a number of response variables, on this case, three or more groups. And if you look at that lower figure, you can see that along the x-axis, there's very little difference in the um, means of group ones and group three. But if you look along the y-axis, they separate quite nicely. And again, this is the kind of thing you're using multivariate analyses to detect uh, differences among these groups that you may not detect simply looking at them uh, one variable at a time. And really, this is the approach that Bohannon uh, 
at all should have used in their chocolate study. Uh, instead of looking at each variable individually, uh, look at all of the response variables simultaneously to find associations among those variables and then ask once you've reduced the dimensionality uh, if there's evidence for differences among the different groups. An approach that's used very commonly in multivariate analyses is an approach called principal components analysis or PCA. And basically, this is just a method to remove correlation among a number of variables. And by doing so, you can reduce what might be a large group of response variables to a smaller number of principal components that explain most of the variation in the original data set. So you can reduce, you know, 15 variables to two or three variables. Obviously, that provides some real advantages in terms of reducing your your chances of a type one error if you're looking at all of these variables individually. The disadvantage now is that you have to interpret if you do find a difference. So you could do a principal components analysis, find these three uh, or four PCA factors, and then ask is there a difference in those PCA factors among the groups that you're comparing? Now, though, you have to interpret that difference uh, on the principal component, not on the original variables. You have correlations between the principal components and the original variables that help you understand what those principal components mean, but there's still one additional step away from the actual measurements that you took on the ground. So an example might be you take 15 different variables at uh, nest sites of bird species in sagebrush habitat, for instance. Maybe you have uh, four or five bird species that nest in this area and you want to ask what differs among the vegetation um, associated with each one of those species and where they place their nests. So rather than looking at each of those variables individually, you would run a principal components and you can see in the figure in the top right score, you might find that uh, grass height and shrub height and forb height are correlated with one another. Um, areas that have taller shrubs have taller grasses. So um, your first PCA might be a measure of vegetation height or Again, you tend to find that cover variables tend to co-vary. So your first PCA may be a higher cover of shrubs, forbs, and grasses um, at sites versus other sites which have lower cover of all of those things. So your first PCA may be some measure of going from low vegetation cover to high vegetation cover. Uh, the second PCA, like I said, may uh, be more associated with measures of vegetation height for different types of uh, vegetation types and so on. So again, you can start to interpret what these PCA um, factors might be, and then you can ask how do the different species differ in um, where they place their nests uh, relative to PCA1, PCA2, and so on and that way get an idea of what are the multivariate factors that differ among these different species. And in a way, it's, it's been used as a, an approach to measuring the niche parameters of different species. Uh, but again, you, you are making a somewhat subjective interpretation of what each one of those PCA scores means. And, um, you know, depending on what variables you measure, you may get different uh, PCA factors coming out of your analysis. And uh, it's very possible that the species that you're looking at really don't respond to uh, these PCA factors. I should mention that um, a reason that 
uh, multivariate analyses became so popular is has to do with Hutchinson's idea of the niche as a um, hyper volume, as he called it, which implies that species are responding to lots of different environmental variables simultaneously, which uh, makes sense, and I'm sure they are. Uh, but again, whether the particular multivariate approach you use actually measures that is another question. Um, when running a principal components analysis, there's a number of considerations, and this applies to a lot of these multivariate analyses. The first is, is that you need really large sample sizes in order to provide enough information for these data-hungry uh, analyses. And it's generally recommended that um, you need 10 times um, the number of samples as you have variables in your analysis. So if you have 15 variables, which is not hard to uh, do, you would need at least 150, measure, 150 experimental units or sites where you're measuring these, uh, which sometimes is not the case. Uh, you should um, also are assuming that all of those variables are normally distributed, and that often is not the case, especially when you start getting to um, measurements on individual species of vegetation, for instance, um, you know, a particular species of grass or forb may not be present at most of the sites that you, uh, where you can collect your measurements, so those will all be zeros, which then immediately causes problems for normality. Um, and as I talked about, the uh, interpretation of those principal components can be problematic, but different people might interpret, interpret them differently and so on. Um, and then a final step in any PCA analysis is you need to decide how many principal components to include in subsequent analyses. So again, if you have 20 uh, variables that you've measured at each one of your sites, you uh, may decide that three principal components uh, explain most of the variation in those data, or somebody else might decide four or five. There are some uh, fairly objective approaches uh, in multivariate analysis to how to decide how many principal components are included. Eigenvalue is one way using eigenvalues greater than one. Um, but uh, Different uh, scientists might might uh, do this differently. So again, it just throws some subjectivity into that uh, part of the analysis. Factorial analysis is another commonly used uh, multivariate analysis. It has a similar objective to PCA to reduce the number of parameters to the important factors in this case. Um, and it's used when you have groups of variables. In other words, variables that uh, all measure similar kinds of response variables. And you want to know if the uh, response variables in those groups vary consistently. So an example would be wine characteristics. So you might have visual characteristics of how clear the, uh, the wine is and uh, color and so on. You might have taste that has eight different variables, odor, five different variables. And you want to ask, do those groups of variables all vary in some similar fashion that can help you understand differences among different types of wines? And the same kinds of considerations that we talked about for PCA apply here. You need to have big sample sizes, assuming normality of all the variables, and then the final step of interpretation and uh, whether you feel there's strong covariation and so on can be somewhat subjective. Discriminant analysis is used a lot in morphological kinds of uh, studies where you go out and measure a whole bunch of different variables on individual fish, for example, 
from different rivers or different lakes or wherever you might um, be working uh, to ask, is there evidence for consistent morphological differences among these groups? And so the focus is on finding separation among your groups. Uh, so it makes it fairly different from uh, PCA and factor analysis. So for an example, there was a study done, uh, and there's a link down below here, uh, to looking at morphometrics of snow trout in the Himalayas. And this is a single species that's found in a number of different uh, river drainages. And the question was, is there evidence for consistent morphological differences among the fish in these different drainages? So they measured 31 different variables, total length, distance from the eye to the mouth, dorsal, dorsal fin length, all the kinds of things that um, people who study fish like to measure. And they wanted to know, was there evidence for consistent differences among the different rivers? Um, and here you can actually see one of the figures from their paper where they did find evidence that these groups differ. And now these discriminant factors, as they're called, um, are developed to maximize the differences among those groups. So rather than looking for correlations, uh, the factors are developed to basically cause as much spread and discrimination among the groups as possible. And um, again, here you need large sample sizes, uh, multivariate normality, and in many cases, interpreting exactly what those discriminant factors are, again, can be, can be a challenge. Another approach is what's called cluster analysis, where again, the objective is to separate groups based on multiple variables. Um, examples would be a dendrogram showing lineages or species uh, separation. It's sometimes used in uh, genetic analyses as well, although there's more sophisticated approaches being used now. Uh, but you go out and take a number of measurements of, you know, maybe something at an archaeological dig or um, looking at a bunch of species in a particular genus, for instance, and asking where do you see sort of cutoffs in similarities among those species. And I've drawn a sketch of a dendrogram here. Uh, one of the considerations is where you draw that horizontal line that cuts across the dendrogram to uh, define the different groups. You could draw it down near the bottom, in which case you just have two groups. Or as you move that line up, uh, you'll have more and more groups. And sometimes deciding where that distinction is made can be, again, somewhat subjective. The last type of multivariate analysis we'll talk about is what's called canonical correlation analysis. And again, this is used to investigate the relationship between two groups of variables, kind of like uh, factor analysis, uh, to ask whether there's uh, association between those groups of variables and if they can uh, possibly be used interchangeably to explain, say, the distribution of a species. This example is a habitat selection of mosquito species in Cameron based on water measurements, um, such as turbidity and temperature and so on, versus physical characteristics of the water body, um, whether it's in shady areas versus open areas, whether the bottom is sand versus mud, um, and so on. And um, what they found is that there was evidence for association among these different types of variables, and that there were certain species that fell out on one side of this multivariate spectrum. So this species, um, Synctis, on the far right, tended to be found in clear streams that were well shaded, uh, lodic, so um, again, clear flowing kinds of water uh, 
And so you may be able to simply look at a stream and quickly say, okay, this is in a shaded area, fairly clear, not much turbidity. Uh, this is a species we'd expect to be here versus on the left, the Evangensis uh, tends to occur in uh, areas with uh, more muddy uh, bottoms, turbid water, more out in the open. Um, <clears throat> And um, again, you could quickly assess that those kinds of more descriptive variables and say, okay, this is the mosquito species we expect to occur in these sorts of situations. And you may not have to do all the other measurements of pH and temperature and so on. Anytime you're looking at lots and lots of uh, variables, you have the potential for coming up with spurious uh, results like shown in this uh, cartoon here. In a sense, multivariate analyses might help you avoid this sort of thing of uh, like we saw with Bohannon of just running correlations among dozens of different variables and asking which ones come out significant. Uh, so by reducing the number of response variables using PCA or factor analysis. Perhaps uh, this sort of outcome can be avoided, but um, anytime you're dealing with lots of variables, um, some of which may not be normally distributed, you have to be very careful about single outlier points driving those relationships. It's always important to plot all of the correlations to make sure that uh, you, you get a cloud of points like this as opposed to a whole bunch of points down at the bottom and one up in the far right that's driving uh, some correlation, for instance. So it, uh, it definitely requires taking a hard look at the data and making sure that there's not some spurious effects going on and uh, having a good statistician help you out with that can be very, very important. So just to finish up on this, multivariate analyses can be a very helpful tools in ecological studies and in many ways uh, underpin our concept of the niche, as I mentioned, uh, that Hutchinson gave us of a multivariate hypervolume uh, and that species respond to many different environmental vi variables um, simultaneously. But the uh, potential for abuse of these kinds of approaches is great. Uh, they're sometimes referred to as fishing expeditions where you just measure a whole bunch of things, throw them in into analysis like it's a black box and then look at what comes out the other end. If you do that, you're almost always gonna get yourself in trouble. Uh, you really need to look at what's happening inside that black box to make sure there's not some really spurious effects going on. You also need very large sample sizes, as we've talked about. Um, those variables need to be normally distributed in most cases and uh, meet the assumptions of equal variances among the groups. Um, where people can often get into trouble is an interpretation. And again, this is a good place where retroduction and storytelling can happen in uh, many cases. And then I'll let you um, read the quote by Daniel and Wood there. Um, but I'll just mention that uh, Eric Rickstad and a number of faculty at uh, Colorado State looked at a number of multivariate analyses, published a paper in JWM um, looking at that and they included things like the ERA scores of pitchers in uh, the major leagues and the price of meats and um, delis that they found uh, in town. So completely unrelated uh, variables and in some cases found relationships that, um, you know, would seemingly suggest there's some insights or some relationships there. So again, it just, uh, it's not that the techniques themselves are inherently bad, it's just that they are very complex and you need to be very careful when using and interpreting uh, output from multivariate analyses.